John Cooper Powys was a British writer, poet and philosopher. Born in 1872 in Shirley in Derbyshire, the son of Reverend Francis Charles Powys and Mary Cooper Johnson as one of eleven children. The family would leave Shirley in 1879 and would eventually settle in Montacute in Somerset. Powys was educated at Sherborne School and then at the University of Cambridge. In 1896, he married Margaret Lyon. Subsequently, he worked as a teacher at girls' schools at Brighton and Eastbourne, before he became an extension lecturer for England on behalf of Oxford and Cambridge in 1898. From 1905, he was employed as lecturer by the American Society for the Extension of University Teaching. He would travel through the US and Canada, only returning to the UK for the summer. His lengthy absences from Britain led him to seeking extramarital affairs, such as with poet Francis Gregg, and later with Phyllis Plater. Plater would become his long-time partner, though Powys could not manage to divorce his wife. In 1921, Powys was the final witness at the obscenity trial against the Little Review magazine over the publication of James Joyce's Ulysses. Although Powys argued for the literary merits of the book, the publication of the book in the United States was banned, and it was not permitted publication in the States until the 1933 United States vs. One Book Called Ulysses Trial. Powys' first financially successful novel was his 1929 Wolf Solent. In 1930, Powys and Phyllis Plater moved to Hillsdale in Columbia County, New York. The pair would leave the US for Britain in 1934, settling in the historical town of Corven, where Powys would immerse himself in the study of Welsh language and culture, writing Owen Glendover and Porteus while living there. Given Powys's propensity for writing very lengthy works, such as a Glastonbury romance at about 1,170 pages, it is not surprising to learn that Porteus was originally written as a 750-page opus, and was only published in full in 2007. Powys and Plater moved to Blenau Festiniog in 1955, where Powys would pass away in 1963. Morwin, or The Vengeance of God, came out in 1937. The novel is a bit of an anomaly in respect to Powys's output, usually taking place in England and Wales, because while two-thirds, and subsequently half, of the cast is Welsh, the novel takes place primarily in Hell. The narrator, referred to in story only as Captain, though once referring to himself as Captain Shandy, finds himself on an afternoon walk when the earth suddenly engulfs him, along with Morvin, a girl he knows is in love with him, and her anonymous father, a well-known vivisectionist. The group wind up in a giant grey cavern, where they soon begin to meet people who are long dead, and that is when they get the idea they may in fact be in hell. Specifically in a hell where those who are guilty of torturing and maiming others in life are constantly consumed by their sadistic passions without any outlet, that is, until several living persons happen to literally fall from the sky. Now for the elephant in the room. Surely the word vivisection is said more often in this novel than almost any other. The seeming purpose of this fantastical journey is to condemn the practice of vivisection, and to equate it to religious fanaticism. And in case one doesn't get the message right away, Powys is sure to repeat it many times. Indeed, the narrator finds the need to repeat the same things over and over again, such as when he and the girl and her father are walking in the beginning of the novel, where the same thing about Morwin's feelings for the narrator are repeated so often that even the writer himself feels the need to comment on it. And it's not just that either. Scenes of having a scientific and religious sadist from history go on and on as to how their torture is justified by religion slash science repeat way too often. Part 1 ends by using Morvin's deceased father and the Inquisitor Torquemada to provide this contrast. Then we get a random priest and scientist at the very tail end of Part 1, used for the exact same purpose, 
And then we have another such pair only a few pages later in part two. The novel picks up again when the narrator and company are trying to escape an army of ghosts who want to torture them to death for their own amusement, but then the plot sort of just stops. And then we have scenes where Socrates and the Welsh poet Taliesin, and basically everyone else, go on lengthy sermons as to the evils of vivisection. The novel then ends with Morvin going on an anti-vivisection pilgrimage to America with her father's supposedly repentant ghost, while leaving the narrator to be carried home by the ghost of Socrates. She even takes away the narrator's dog for company. But while she is doing all this, abandoning the seriously injured narrator to go on her holy quest, she never wavers in her decision, despite the fact her father is obviously just faking his supposed reformation. He even bluntly states in front of her that he still thinks a little suffering of the lower animals and even lower races can bring benefit to humanity. And yet she takes no note of this, despite this same man having previously waived his own rights as her parent, giving her away to be tortured by a ghostly mob of sadists in exchange for the right to torment the narrator's dog. The novel's biggest problem is that it gets too caught up in how it wants to make absolutely sure to denounce the evils of vivisection on every other page. So it doesn't even have the time to describe events the reader would be interested in, such as how the narrator got home in the first place. While not bad per se, it is rather flawed, definitely not living up to the blurb on the cover calling it a terrifying journey into hell.